It is so good to be reunited with this pulpit after um, being away for many weeks in, in Advent and, of course, not able to be with you on Christmas. In her prose poem called Boxed, Anne Weems writes about the time in her home when the creche is put away marking the end of the Christmas season for another year. I must admit to a certain guilt, she writes, about stuffing the Holy Family into a box in the aftermath of Christmas. And then she goes on to describe each one of the characters in a way that you and I can easily relate to. The child she's most reluctant to put away. She describes baby Jesus as being forever attached to his cradle and how she hates turning him upside down and putting him unceremoniously in the straw so that his hands reached out in blessing don't get cut off. She describes his mother Mary, eternally dressed in blue. Joseph, she says, is holding valiantly onto what's left of his staff, it having been broken by a child some 20 years ago who held onto it too tightly. The wise ones with their gifts look so elegant, even though the standing camel has lost his back leg and the sitting one has lost an ear. We confuse the shepherds with Joseph, she writes, because they all wear the same dull brown. The sheep and the donkey are in disrepair. I laughed when I read that because our golden retriever, Rosie, in her puppyhood, once chewed the bottom right off our donkey. They are not a grand set, Anne Weems notes, but one that children and grandchildren can touch and move about to reenact that silent night. And this year, she says in closing, when it's time to pack the figures away, we'll be more careful that peace and goodwill are also not boxed away. May this be so for each one of us in 2023. Well, I don't know about your home, but there are still signs of Christmas lingering around Bishophurst. Those parcels that haven't quite found a home yet, way too much baking on the kitchen counter, stubborn pine needles from the tree refusing to be sucked up by the vacuum, and the crash perched on the landing of the stairs, waiting to be banished to our musty basement for another year. In the church, we are given directions about how the figures in the creche will be changed and put away on Epiphany Sunday. And those of you in the altar guild will know what I'm about to read. The shepherds and the animals are removed from the creche and replaced with the magi and their camels before the start of the Epiphany service. And then the entire creche is removed from the church after the last liturgy on the baptism of the Lord. That was last Sunday here at St. Luke's. And just like that, the Christmas season is over. Today we find ourselves in the second Sunday of seven, in this new season known as Sundays after Epiphany, a string of Sundays in which the church celebrates the fact that God is manifest, made known in a human being, 
also divine, the anointed one, Jesus of Nazareth. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. John writes this in the prologue of his gospel, and there it is, the connection between the incarnation or the birth of Jesus, Jesus is coming into the world, and the epiphany, Jesus made manifest to the world. There's a complex and interesting history of epiphany within the life of the church. It's interesting that the Western church came to emphasize Christmas, deciding on the date of December the 25th, while the Eastern church emphasized Epiphany, or January the 6th. And so the Eastern Church's Christmas includes not only a celebration of Jesus' birth, but also the arrival of the Magi and his baptism. Good luck to a preacher in the Eastern Church on Christmas Day. For us now, that word Epiphany is there each week in these Sundays to come, orienting us and reminding us of the arrival of the first Epiphany with a capital E, but also of the many manifestations of Jesus, little Epiphanies, little E Epiphanies to the world. And over the next several weeks, we will be following these little E manifestations of Jesus as Jesus becomes known. We saw it last week and this week through his baptism and this week and next week through the calling of his first disciples where Jesus begins to gather around him a community of learners. That's what disciples are, learners. And did you note in today's gospel how the learning begins with a two-way questioning between Jesus and his followers? What are you looking for? asks Jesus. Who are you, they reply. And where are you staying, they ask another question. And then that beautiful invitation, come and see. It's been said that the rest of John's gospel is a response to these fundamental questions. And so now as we continue to move through the season of Epiphany, we will hear Jesus' teachings, his healing miracles. This year, the primary gospel writer is Matthew. The audience is Jewish. Jesus is called rabbi, which means teacher. The focus later on in the season of Epiphany will be his teaching in the Sermon on the Mount, beginning with those beautiful words of the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. And so we find ourselves this morning as a community of learners, as we do Always, when we gather on Sundays, first around the Word of God, and then around the Lord's table, and we feast on both. First with the Word, and then with the bread of life and the cup of salvation, which we bring into ourselves. We all here this morning come from many different places. We have differing personalities 
and for sure different views on any number of subjects. Yet in all of our differences, one thing unites us. We are here this morning because you and I have been called by God. In one way or another, as the dean pointed out in his sermon last week, God's hand has been laid upon us. We are chosen, forgiven, restored, saved for a purpose. There is a sense that we are here because God has put us here. And let me just say that your being in church, worshiping Jesus, and asking similar questions to those first followers, like, who are you, Jesus? Why do you matter? It was actually God's idea before it was yours. But through our baptism, we have been called and commissioned to be Jesus' people in the world. This means that through baptism, we are called to witness in word and deed to what has happened in the world through Jesus Christ. Yesterday morning in my own personal reading, I came across this definition of what a witness is. A witness, the Greek term from which we get the word martyr, simply means witness. So therefore, a witness is someone who is willing to die for their version of the truth. And we have with us this morning Murdoch Carter, and I wonder if he would agree that witnesses in the court would die by their testimony if asked. The early church was filled with Christian martyrs who were willing to do just that for their faith, bear witness to what they had seen and heard and knew about Jesus Christ. Sadly, today we see in men and women who are brainwashed by other causes to die a martyr's death for something that we would think absolutely abhorrent to die for. In this Christian season of Epiphany, we remind ourselves that even as Jesus is called to be the light of the world, we are called to be his lights in the world. That's why when we baptize someone, we give them a candle as these words are said, let your light so shine before others that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. It is why the two outward signs and symbols of baptism are water and light. So we're here because we've been called. And at the end of this sermon, under the light of the Easter ca candle and with Reverend Catherine's leading, we will be renewing the promises that we made at our baptism. How appropriate that our first reading today is from the prophet Isaiah, the prophet that Jesus quotes more than any other. It is appropriate because it can be said of each one of us, just as the prophet Isaiah said of himself, the Lord called me. The Lord called my name, saying, you are my servant Israel, in whom I show my glory. That word servant is important. There are a lot of people who think that the Christian faith, that coming to church on Sundays, is all about something God can do for them, to make them feel comfortable in their comfortable pews. But that's really not how it is. 
The gospel is a story of how Jesus enlists ordinary people to work for him and on his behalf in meeting the needs of the world. Whatever work Jesus wants to do, Jesus never does it alone. That's why he called that community of learners around him. He calls others to help him, people just like you and me. And one of the major reasons why we gather as we do in community is to worship God, to be a learning community, to see his way more clearly so that we might be better equipped to serve him. Which brings me back to Isaiah. The Lord called me before my birth, called my name when I was in my mother's womb. And Isaiah is very clear about the gifts that God has given to him and the work that God wants him to do. He made my mouth like a sharp sword. He made me a sharpened arrow. Isaiah is given, as we are, the mouth to speak up for God, using his own words to proclaim the message of God. And this is true for each one of us. Martin Luther once said that a preacher like me preaches in the church so that the people of God, like you, can preach in the world through the week. Through our words and our actions, we incarnate or make Jesus visible. None of us preach in exactly the same way. But each of us is called to speak up for God in our own contexts by using our own gifts for ministry. <clears throat> so your mouth becomes <coughs> like a sharp sword when you speak out against an injustice when you see it happening, <clears throat> you become a sharpened arrow when you bring a word of hope, encouragement, or speak a word of comfort that goes straight to someone's heart when they are despairing. In doing so, you become a servant of God in whom God shows his glory. <clears throat> Let your light shine. Now the day before my mother died was a particularly difficult day for my brother, my sister-in-law, and I. Our mother was in terrible pain, and there was nothing we could do to alleviate it. Not even me, her daughter. Nothing was making a difference in that moment. But just before noon on that day, there was a knock on the door of her home. And there stood two personal support workers from next door. We heard that Nora is sick, they said, and we'd like to come in and pray with her, just as she prayed with us when we were going through a hard time. And in they came. And then a little later, her next door neighbor came in with two Yorkshire Terriers. May I visit your mother? 
And a bit later on, a woman from her Friday morning prayer group arrived with her guitar and sang hymns to her. They did what we could not do. But in their words and in their actions, they incarnated, made real, made manifest Jesus' love for my mother and for us. Sharpened arrows made their way right into my mother's heart and ours. And my mother's eyes opened in each of those visits. And she said, how beautiful. They were some of the last words we heard her say. My friends, never underestimate the gift that God has given to you to incarnate Jesus and be the Jesus that others are longing to meet in their lives. I began with a prose poem by Anne Weems, the 21st century mystic. And I close with one that is attributed to St. Teresa of Avila, a 16th century Spanish mystic. And these words she wrote as a letter to her nuns towards the end of her life. Christ has no body now on earth but yours, no hands but yours, no feet but yours. Yours are the eyes through which to look out Christ's compassion to the world. Yours are the feet with which he goes about doing good. Yours are the hands with which he is to bless all people now. May we not, in this season of Epiphany, stuff Jesus into a box and relegate him to our musty basements. But may we be his living body in the world and let his light shine. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.